Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Andrew, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from me each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra-long episode of the podcast each Saturday, and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200-plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. And now here's Andrew with your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding. See you next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Let's talk about what makes a perfect stock. The one thing okay. that everybody sets out to do in investing, hopefully, is look for a perfect stock. And does that always mean the perfect business? Does that always mean the uh, most, you know, the most simple business? Like what does the perfect right. stock mean? Does it mean the stock that's going to give you the best IRR? All right, let's break it down. What makes the perfect stock? Because I don't know right. if the perfect stock is the same as the best business or, no. you know, vice versa. What does that mean? No. So I would say the perfect stock would be a stock that meets the criteria that you need uh, all of them, it checks all the boxes basically. So the, the way that I've described that, and this is not, this will not give you your best return, but this is in a sense, the thing that you can be the surest of buying into and stuff, you know, in a sense that we mean perfect, it doesn't have flaws. So what that would mean really is that it would be an above average industry, right? And then in that above average industry, you get an above average company in that industry. And then you have it run by an above average management. And then you pay a below average price. Beautiful. Okay. So four things. So let's break it down. Yeah. Let's start with one above average industry. What right. does that mean? So that would mean um, things like because you said right. in a recent podcast with Peter Lynch that some great opportunities are um, businesses that are growing fast in a right. no growth industry. Yes. So an above average industry could be th- could be as simple as things like um, branded consumer things, alcohol, tobacco, stuff like that. Um, Some of them have problems and might not be growing that fast anymore, but they're above average industries. Why I say they're above average is compare them to shipbuilding, coal, and things like that. Those are below average. So, And then more of the average, we could say, would be like um, your average retailer, your average, uh, maybe your average car dealer, though car dealer might be a slightly above average business. But when we mean well above average business, someone asked in the Q&A about like spirits or something. Well, the spirits industry would be above average. We would all agree on that. It earns above average returns on capital. It grows okay. It creates a lot of fortunes and things. So yes, spirits. And that's a great way to see what a good industry is, right? If they Mm -hmm. have a lot of billionaires in the industry, that's probably a good tip. Right, and especially there could be a good or a lot of ways to create wealth. Yeah. So we talked about before, like um, the uh, uh, core processing in in banking and stuff, right? So the core processors, the companies like Jack Henry and all those sorts of things, um, that would be above average. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's number one. Then you would want an above average company in that industry. So a lot of times you have like, you can identify Costco. Okay, so that's great. Costco, way above average retailer. I can identify it. I know it's successful. Chipotle, no one's going to argue it's not an above average fast food company. But the risk comes into what if that, I lose that over time. What if Costco becomes only as good as other retailers? What if Chipotle becomes only as good as other fast food concepts? If that happens, the dip in the economics is so severe because unlike core processing, the difference between the best uh, restaurants and retailers and the middle of the pack is really big. So in, in, in essence, you don't have as much of a margin of safety other than they continue to succeed, which is a Phil Fisher approach, right? You want to bet on companies that continue to be excellent in their industry. So that's why you need like those leaders. But most people are picking leaders who aren't necessarily in the best industries, which means if it falls apart for them, it falls apart badly. I mean, the examples are like, you know, Sears was the leader forever Mm -hmm. in its industry, dominated it. And then look what happens after it, uh, after you're no longer the leader, decades of poor performance and stuff. General Motors was huge leader in the U S in market share stuff, but the industry of auto of, uh, of autos and stuff just isn't that great that all the top four or five are, are doing okay. Mm-hmm. There, it's much more forgiving to, if we picked one of the top five ad agencies, things don't go so great there. 
they usually aren't going to drop the way that Sears ended up dropping or General Motors ended up dropping or something like that. And, you know, that's the problem because maybe you find a new core Mm -hmm. and you're like, I believe in this organization and in all of that. And you love it. You know, all the Phil Fisher sorts of things, you find them, you love them, all of that. And you believe in the organization. But at the end of the day, if they fail to differentiate themselves continuously, they will have the returns of a steel company, you know? And so that's why you want both of those things. Is there a way to find industries that are like this? Yeah. I mean, industries where there's not as much disparity between the leaders and the laggards that way. Sure. Industries where almost everyone makes a pretty good profit. So I was going to say where it's not like a winner take all type of market. Right. Oligopolies tend to have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, You don't you don't want ones where there's sort of winner takes all. Like you said, you don't want ones where there's huge turnover and who the leaders are over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things like that. Um, Okay, then. an able person running it, right? An above average person. You would want an above business. average management. This so, is something that we yeah. have experience with and talk about a lot, mm-hmm. um, especially in the micro cap world. It's, I think, probably one of, it's probably the most important thing in a micro cap right. is a person running it. So this is the kind of thing of when we're talking about perfect stock, the problems of putting it together. A lot of times people kind of spotlight the one thing they're buying on, which is like, I love the management here. So there was one case where I was looking at that recently and they're like, Aren't, isn't this great management or whatever? And, that's great. They are. Um, but it was in like a shipping sort of thing. And it's kind of a tough business that way. And another one, it was in an insurance thing that I thought was like a pretty tough insurance thing. Um, there's one that I was looking at recently where I think they're a really good. I really like the management, really do. Um, but it's sort of banking without a great deposit base. So it's kind of like you have an okay cost of your funds and stuff. But then on top of that, you're kind of just operating like a investment fund like you're just buying loans in the secondary market and stuff for a major part of your business and then you're originating loans to all sorts of things that aren't really close customers of yours and that's tough and people will say like isn't that a great management team yes but it's such a tough business it's not you know um uh i was reading a buffett thing recently and buffett was joking and buffett was talking about how uh the ceo of coke hated bill gates Oh, really? Uh, Because Bill Gates had been asked a question and Gates and Buffett talked all the time about Coke. And Buffett had said, like, privately, Coke is such a is such a great brand and stuff. It could be run by a ham sandwich. (laughs) And so Buffett and so Gates kind of made a comment of like, oh, well, you know, um, (laughs) it came out sort of as like a tech company like Microsoft is so hard to run because things are changing all the time and stuff. Whereas Coke, you know, it's something that's a lot easier and stuff. And I wish I was running that kind of thing instead. But it came out to the CEO is like, I'm a genius. And that's why my company's successful. And you're just working at Coke. (laughs) So that's the thing is like a great management team in a bad industry um doesn't mean the same thing and i get that a lot from people who talk about like isn't this management team amazing yes i I mean there's lots of cases where i like them and whatever but if it's they're up against really hard problems then it's very difficult well and buffett has that quote when a reputation of a management you know of brilliance takes on a business with a reputation of poor economics it's usually the poor economics that stay intact yes but if we flip it really bad management can mess up even successful businesses mm-hmm. and things like that. So especially because of their control of capital allocation, which Do is you a have very any big examples part of, it. of that that come to mind. Uh, not that come to mind, uh, but there's companies that I, there are companies I haven't invested in because of management. Mm-hmm. I, I've said that before. Um, uh, well, I'll give some examples of companies that I thought could have had an outcome that was different for them than sure. they ended up with. Okay. So if we, th- I'll give two UK examples. I don't know why the UK is in my mind on this one, but um, there's a company called first group. Okay. Uh, things they own that you might know. Uh, do you know Greyhound bus? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. So they own that. Everyone uh, listening. Does um, too. But they also owned, um, they actually are like concessions. So it's not like a permanent thing technically, but some passenger rail in the UK and stuff. But things that are pretty interesting about them were they had like first student, um, which was student busing stuff. And so, so they did busing for like schools, you outsource it to them and they run the school buses for you. And same thing, that's same sort of business for like outsourcing, um, airports and things like that. So if you took like a shuttle bus at an airport, it might be them running it. If you, uh, your kids are bused wherever it could actually be them running it for the school district, all sorts of things like that. In addition to that, they own Greyhound. Um, anyway, they made some decisions that I thought weren't that great. They bid kind of high on some deals and stuff in the UK to do stuff. 
Uh, they used a fair amount of debt while also paying a high dividend and they kept kind of raising the dividend all the time. They seemed almost obsessed with like slightly raising the dividend constantly. I didn't like all that stuff. They ended up doing a rights offering and, and mm-hmm. things like that. I don't know eventually where they ended up since then, but like kind of twice they fell into some pretty serious problems. They also just have like local busing, uh, you know, so like uh, sort of running a private version of like a city's transit system. Um, pretty decent business. It's not a bad business. Mm-hmm. And their position, it wasn't bad either. Uh, I think they could have really been successful if they were run by like um, certain, uh, you know, if they made really, if they were, had the right corporate decisions made there, I think they could have created some shareholder value. And instead, I think that they destroyed a lot over time, but I don't have the, you know, exact numbers. So what about, I know you read this book and I'm like 150 pages in, lights out about GE. Yeah. Right. So let's talk. I mean, what about what what was your interpretation there? I don't I, think in my was opinion, very it was well a, run. I think it was a corporate <laughs> governance disaster at the top with management. Yeah. And their extreme focus on EPS growth mm-hmm. and not growth in cash flows, which a lot of time, if you look at a lot of companies that you could say fall from grace, whatever, mm-hmm. Enron, that tends to be the situation. Do they focus on EPS instead of cash? Yeah. yeah. And the, the, there's a huge disparity in a lot of times between, you know, net income and cash flow. Yes. Um, yep. And they were doing other things as well. GE to, you know, really, um, I guess you could say falsify or smooth earnings per share sure. as well. Which Coke know. was doing at the same time, basically. As yeah, I think there. different times were different too. Yeah. Right. With disclosure and stuff yeah. like that. Um, it's interesting because on the one hand, I think a big part of that is the business one that I said. So I think many of the things at times that GE did also, some of them, not all, but some of those same problems with management stuff happened at times at Disney and Coke and they were much more resilient Mm -hmm. because their businesses are much easier. Sure. And then they also had much better positions in them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, GE literally was a black box. Yes. So, and I think that kind of hid um, management not making some very good decisions on lots of things. It was also typical things. They made a lot of acquisitions and things like Mm -hmm. that. Um, They did some very weird things uh, because the book acquisition accounting. (laughs) Yeah. The the book talks a little bit about the Alstom uh, acquisition. And I only just, that's one that I know a little bit more about because I had researched Babcock and Wilcox and everything. And, and that was a big competitor for them. And so I did a bunch of research into that. And I just thought that was a very, very weak company. And they decided to make it as a really big Transformers sort of deal. Now, to be fair, like Jack Welch and stuff had wanted to end his time there by taking over Honeywell, mm-hmm. which would yeah. have been a big acquisition that I think would have made a lot, would have been a much better acquisition than what they ended up doing, something like the Alstom deal and stuff, which I thought wasn't such a great company. Um, and was in bad shape and stuff too. And they kind of doubled down on a tough industry that way. But you know, uh, so the problem with that is from a management perspective, right? If you ask people at that time, I think they would have said that G had some of the best management, sure. and certainly yeah. the best management lower down in the organization. They said it was, it was like the best business it. school to go to, you know, you'd yeah. go there and if you wanted to leave, you, you would have like a CEO spot somewhere else. Yeah. But was it, was that perception wrong? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What companies like, I mean, cause GE was very much the company, like everyone wanted to not everybody, but it was just like you were an all-star if you were mm-hmm. there, right, and working there. And they very much go over that in the book. What company do you think is like that today? Who has that celebrity status? I can tell you who comes to my mind. But I'm curious. If okay. Comes to your mind. I would I would say Amazon. Jeff Bezos. Oh, Amazon. Very much so. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah. I was, no, I mean, of course, totally different businesses, <laughs> very different okay. business models, and everything like that. But just from yeah. an intangible okay. perspective, I that could see definitely that. be true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was, in my opinion, a corporate, I mean, a management disaster. It sounded like no one really knew. Right. But how do you judge from the outside and people just assume that they have good management or whatever? Yeah. Well, they even said at some point, it's like, you have to trust us, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. is because you can't, I mean, even people at management didn't know a hundred percent of what was going on and no one does at any company, but I think at GE, it was very much. You know, like it was that. it was bad at G. They didn't know that they hadn't sold all off all their insurance. Yeah, they really didn't. There were people really high up in the organization who didn't really understand that. So mm-hmm. that's pretty bad. Who were the best CEOs that you've seen outside of you know the typical Bezos and Buffett? Hmm. Jamie Dimon, but we okay. talk about him a lot. We give him credit a lot. Yeah, outside of let's say those three. 
Yeah, I mean, I've told you in, um, let's see, where they are now. Uh, okay, so, well, I think Wikipedia will tell us, right? Sure. So, um, if we look, uh, you can get me the names for it. I am curious, because I mentioned these stocks before, uh, just do J&J Snack Foods. How long he's, I assume he's still, J and, yeah, J and oh, J. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. Yep. If you go to their Wikipedia thing, do they still have the same? Yeah, so they still have the same CEO. So how long has he been there? If you click on the Wikipedia thing, it should show you. Will it come up, up? Into the right? Yeah. 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 So let's see. So J and J Snack Foods, um, I was just curious how long he's been there. It was just to show his history in 1971. Wow. Okay, so he's been there. So, so he's been there since 1971. I don't know if he has a 44 way. years of consecutive sales growth. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, I, I think it's very good. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. And I thought it was very good when I read interviews and stuff with him early on, and it made a big impression on me. The things he was saying and stuff, and he was a big reason why I bought into the company. Mm -hmm. It's Jerry Schreiber, Gerald Schreiber, right? Schreiber. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so he's basically been there since the beginning and has probably had a lot of success. Do you have the max for J&J Snack Foods, how it's done, if we look at that? Probably doesn't go back that far on Google. Oh, yeah, it does. It goes back to... 86. Yeah, so in 86, it was a $2 stock, and now it's $136 stock. So he's done fine. Um, and it didn't have any of the advantages over the big food companies and things there and all that, just like building it up and everything. What I mean is if you inherited something that was amazing that way, you could have had um, you know, a lot of success, but... That's not what happened. Sure. And he was able to grow against those things that whole time. Um, I also said uh, Activision. So if we go there, I always liked Activision's management a lot better than, and there were actually two people that were important to it, um, than at Electronic Arts. Actually, Electronic Arts, I didn't like that. So if we go down, who are the key people? So we see now, yeah, you have the key people that they list there, the chairman and the CEO. And does it tell us in there, let's see, it, the Chairman doesn't have a Wikipedia page, right? No. Nope. So if we go back and check, click on the one for the CEO, they'll probably tell me when he was there from until. Okay. Uh, when did he start? He purchased stake in action so in 1990 and became CEO the next year, 1991. Yeah. And then he's still CEO as of today? Looks yes. like it, yep. CEO of the combined company. Yeah. So yeah, so for 29 years or whatever, he's been there. And he was a big reason why I read about it in the late 90s that I th thought so. However, they don't talk about the chairman, but I also actually thought the combination of the chairman and CEO was meaningful mm -hmm. here. Um, I liked what both of them were saying. So uh, so yeah. So uh, so Robert A. Kotick is, the, is his official name. I think Bobby is what he's always called. Um, and I liked him as well as... Uh, Gerald Schreiber. So those are two names. I you probably know the Act Activision. I've, I it's a very very public company. Probably on CNBC yeah. all the time uh -huh. and stuff. Yeah. But you know, um, and their letters from a long time ago. I don't know if you can find them and stuff. Um, I mean, I don't want you to find them now. But there, are, you can see some things that I read a very long time ago about it. Um, what was interesting is their way of thinking about it. So I just thought they thought about video games in a way that would, they took it very seriously as a business, uh, -huh. uh very seriously not as the like idea a, of capital allocation, basically. Got yeah. It. As a, which is not how anyone in that industry thought of it. Got it. Um, okay. So then the last one, okay. A good price. We've talked about that a lot on this podcast, what that could mean. Right. But then you look okay, at a I, like booking that. No, I would say the perfect stock has to be a below average price. Well, that's what I meant by like a good. Okay. So no, no, no. So then. it's not a perfect stock. If you pay 20 times earnings for it. Okay. I was in my head. I was meaning like a cheap, a cheap price, but okay, cheap, so yeah. a below average price. So bank of America, what you just said was 11 times earnings that can fit the, uh, perfect stock. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we look at, um, if we look at like, um, an example, like, you know, let's say, uh, so you and Vettel on the rundown, we're talking about Costco, right? And we're saying he was saying that Costco turned out to be cheap at 24 times earnings. Yep, that's good, but it's not a perfect stock. Okay, it, Why it can not? work because here's the problem with each of these. So if each of these things work for you, if you pick an above average industry, yep, where there's an above average player in that industry that you buy into, the above average business in that industry, actually, I should say, um, a above average company, then you have an above average management running it right now, and they're, you're hoping they'll stay around, and then you get a below average price, then you're building in a huge margin of safety because as any of these things fail, 
there's the safeguard that it can still work out. So if you lose the great management, like say I liked Activision Blizzard's management or J&J Snackfoot's management, right? So you get them for 30 years and then they die or whatever. Yeah. And some so-so guy comes in. Uh, yeah, but now you- the ham sandwich. But, but now, yeah. So now it's being run by a ham sandwich, but now you have some of the leading position in the industry or whatever, uh -huh. you know? You were protected by it. Whereas if that had happened in the first few years, there wouldn't be much protection. So if you're, so, you know, if you're in a really good business, right? And now you have a, someone running it who's not very good. That's not such a big deal. If you have a great management, but the business actually isn't that great, well, maybe you can turn things around and stuff. Look at um, uh, railroads with Hunter Harrison, right? Mm -hmm. So each railroad, was it a top organization there? Probably not. But when he came in, he was able to bring them up to the level of the top organization. Yeah. So you had the management thing. If it's a top industry, then okay, even if you end up being not that great, You'll fall to the fourth or fifth place. People will complain that your results aren't as good as other people's, whatever. Yeah. Being the fourth or fifth most efficient ad agency, fourth or fifth most efficient elevator company, fourth lime, whatever, you're not going to be in bankruptcy. Uh -huh. I mean, unless you do something stupid, you're not going to yeah. be in bankruptcy. But the fourth semiconductor, uh, you know, in, you know, in, in certain categories and things, yeah, you're going to be out of business. So, um, you, you have an, so if each of these things are sort of like a fallback. Like what if other stuff goes wrong? Sure. And that's where price comes in. Because if you buy at a good price, which is what my example was with J&J, &J, right? Mm -hmm. If you buy at a price that's like um, 10, let, let's say even, let's, let's say an average price is 15. Okay, so I'll give you 14 times earnings, 14.9 times earnings you can buy up to, right? <laughs> then, then if you turn out to be wrong about all these things, it's still like a so-so stock, back, people will yeah, say. Saying, so people yeah. will say, oh, it's just, it shouldn't, the margin, the multiple shouldn't contract, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at the problem of, like so we say Costco is like 40 times earnings now. Well, if Costco becomes a mediocre company, yeah. then it's it's going to drop, you know, whatever that is, 60 or 70% or something. Um, instead of if you have a company that's 10 times, mm -hmm. which is what we were saying before, you know, like, um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, like if you like put in progressive as an example, progressive, the insurance company. So why would I like progressive or whatever is basically that, um, most of the things that I was saying, what's the ticker? PGR. PGR. You just do PGR. Many of the things I was saying, I like management fine there. I, I won't, uh, I won't say whether they're like far above average or below, but they're certainly not worse. The, the top management in the culture and stuff is not worse than our other companies there. So the price to book is high though, right? But you have a PE that's below 15, like we said. Yep. So if they can grow as fast or faster than other companies, then you'd think it would be successful that way. Um, the industry is tough. Progressive and Geico and USAA have structures that are pretty good after them it gets bad though mm -hmm. so it's actually not i wouldn't call car insurance a great industry um so that's a tough part about it and then um i think the industry is the part that falls down for me company is 100 percent yes they're definitely an above average company in the industry no doubt about it the organization's above average but it does fall down a bit on the other ones that i was saying you know um and you can apply this to any sort of stock that you have where you're you're trying to figure out what is the what makes this an imperfect stock, which mm -hmm. doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it. Yeah. But what which of the four things we said is the problem area I need to focus in on and see if this risk can kill me in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like is it that I'm paying way then paying too high a price? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, is it not way too high a price or whatever, you know? Is it that so I So you think like the price is like your fallback? It's the ultimate fallback. Not paying too high of a price. Because if you're wrong on the first three, but you still pay less than, or let's say you pay 12 times earnings, you're not going right. to get that, you know, people are just going to view it as they always view it, which is why it's yes. 12 times earnings. Yes, but you have to be careful, okay? Because a bad management and a bad industry, the fallback is it's worth nothing. Okay. You know? Yeah, sure. It, that yeah. could happen real fast. Yeah. So, um, and, and bad management certain things could be, I mean, like, let's take an example. Say I like insurance or banking pretty much, right? Yeah. But say I knew the company is below average, in underwriting, in, in lending, in its history of its culture of whatever. And then they bring in a, a management I don't like, mm -hmm. okay? 
well, like there's bankruptcy risk and stuff in there. Sure. If they start, you know, so. I, but is the that something that you can, can see in advance? Yes. Right. Because you have talked about a lot of times when you sell out of a stock, it's because of the capital allocation that they do. Y- yes, you can see it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, a lot of times. Uh, now, sometimes people argue about that because you know, banking is a good example. There are people. Uh, yeah, banking is a good example. There are people that have talked to me and stuff and say this is an above average management. Uh huh. And I think for me, it's a below average management. Like why? What does that mean? They're excessive risk taking. Okay, got it. Okay. So you're so judging them based on the lending that they're doing. Right. And and that doesn't mean they didn't have success. What was it with uh, Chesapeake, right? The energy company, right? So they did have a lot of success for a while. I mean, they did. Uh, but even while having that success, they were using massive amounts of leverage in all sorts of ways. Yeah. And um, it was... It was clearly a high risk sort of strategy the whole way through, I think, even yeah. when they were successful. It wasn't like it changed from being a successful business to an unsuccessful one. It was uh, because of something that radically changed in the industry. It was something that, that happened because of the risk taking and stuff that uh-huh. was there. And so I think you can sometimes have a good um, performance for a while while I don't like the way that you're approaching it. But this happens all the time. because Performance like, in the stock or the business? Sometimes both the business definitely, especially with a commodity business. If you just bet the right way on it, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. If you bet the right way on it, then you were successful. Buffett was successful for two years just buying Berkshire Hathaway and textiles. Mm-hmm. It got better and it just gushed capital compared yeah. to what he had uh-huh. put in. Um, so if we happen to time something perfectly, or we bought in, like say natural gas now, if we bought in now and it happens to go up a lot, then you know, sure. yeah. yeah. Um, and then, like, the other one was, uh, like, we've mentioned before, Majestic Wine. A lot of people were excited about the CEO coming, and I was opposite of excited about that. Just because he very entrepreneurial, but not the person that I would want running a company, really. Yeah. More the person you'd want founding a company. So there's sometimes real disagreement on what that means about management. Yeah. What's good management? What's bad management? And then there are actually complicated questions. Like, we've read Disney War. Yes. Was Eisner a good CEO or not? I think he had a lot of good people around him. Right, so that's one of the arguments is wasn't yeah. that he had a lot of good people around yeah. him. But he also made some important good decisions in the first 10 years. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and at other times, there are people, you have to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Like when people were asking about Katzenberg and stuff as a CEO and everything, yeah. or his DreamWorks and everything, where I consider him a great CEO or something, I consider him a very good, excellent producer. Like, really great producer. Um, but if you put him in charge of a company that was doing... Uh, you know, it would if you put him in charge Streaming. of Time Warner instead of in charge of the movie studio, uh, you know, the live action movie studio only yeah. part of a company. I don't know. I wouldn't say that's a great CEO necessarily. Yeah. But I no doubt that if you had someone, but you'd rather have him producing movies, or you have him doing your slate of movies that you had each year, overseeing all those different things. If he has a manageable amount of movies, if he's doing, you know, if you're releasing twelve movies a year then yeah, he's, he's the person you want running a movie studio, but that's not the same as a CEO. So I guess the question is, what makes a good CEO? Well, the most important one is capital allocation. Okay. Okay, capital allocation thinking like an owner is most important by sure. far. So that's the number one. Yes. And then uh, cost conscious, cutting costs and stuff. I would uh, agree with that. It's very important. Um, All the great CEOs that I personally have met, they're very, like they don't lift their finger on anything. Right. They're very much cost conscious. Yeah. And then also, like I said about the risk thing, it's very important to have an idea of the risks that you're taking um, and not to uh, confuse yourself about that. Even when we talk about things like GE and stuff, GE turned itself financially to something that was taking more and more risks. They did a bunch of things that were kind of risky. Like for instance, they had the, that they should have been aware of what they were doing, but they just went ahead and did it anyway. So an example would be they had a commercial paper program that they didn't mm-hmm. backstop fully with um, credit lines. Yeah. And I was talking to someone about that recently, and I was like, you really want to have credit lines you can draw on to buy back all of the uh, facility that you need to make sure that you don't have a hole in your, like that you don't seize up completely in terms of not having cash today just because people won't buy your paper. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to always have term loans and things instead of using borrowing short term. But that's like a, they should have been aware of the risks they were taking by doing that. And that's a sign of risk taking that way, you know. Mm. Buffett sold out of uh, one of the GSEs when he saw what they were putting in their portfolio that was different than what you would normally put in there, that he felt there was mission creep and stuff and what they were doing. Um, Same sort of thing. When you see them kind of taking on risks that you don't want them to do, you know, strategically and stuff it can Mm -hmm. be. So I I think risk taking, cost consciousness, 
and capital allocation ideas, you know? And if you read like people that are good CEOs, they're very much focused on that. Like, yeah, you know, like even, if you did, I mean, even the ascent of, you know, Jamie Dimon talking to right. like last man standing, he was reading Buffett when he was 25 and 30, yeah. you know, very early on in his career. And, and, very much took to the way that he thought about capital allocation. Even if, even if you read a lot of what Jamie Dimon either writes or says today, it's very much, you could tell, like the way he thinks mm -hmm. about capital allocation is, you know, very smart and prudent. Yeah. And when, and when I say those sorts of things, I don't mean like with the risk thing, I don't mean that they have to be real conservative or something. Yeah. But just even if you're running Amazon or something in the early days, don't make a bet that you could lose the whole company on, mm -hmm. right? So like even when you're drastically growing, that seems like a risky thing, but actually you need to do that to survive in that industry, you know? You have to have a real idea of the survival for the long term, not just like this year's earnings and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, both on YouTube and the podcast side of things. Thank you so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Jeff, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from Jeff each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra long episode of the podcast each Saturday, and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200-plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next podcast.